Welcome to Behind the Book, brought to you by the American Immigration Lawyers Association. This program takes you behind the scenes of AILA's best-selling publications. We begin this series with one of the most talked about publications to recently hit the market. Released in June 2011, Business Immigration Law and Practice is on its way to holding a prominent spot on the shelves of practitioners. Join us as we go behind the book with authors Daryl Buffenstein and Bo Cooper. Daryl Buffenstein and Bo Cooper are partners in the corporate immigration law firm Barry Appleman in Leiden. BAL is well known for handling the needs of employers around the world. And Daryl Buffenstein is a giant in this field with more than 30 years of business immigration practice under his belt. He's written key provisions in every major piece of immigration legislation over the past 16 years. Bo Cooper served as general counsel to Legacy INS. He's been a major player in the legislative arena for decades and is a well-known immigration strategist. With more than 50 years of immigration practice experience between them, the authors combined their knowledge and expertise to bring forth one of the most comprehensive resources on the practice of business immigration. How does your book seek to guide practitioners and provide them with the tools they need to achieve the best possible results for their clients? This is one of those things that can be so jolting about immigration law and business immigration law in particular. Um, so many other areas of law are so orderly. There's a statute. The agency regulates. The agency takes actions under the regulations. There's federal court um, analysis of the agency actions. There's agency interpretations and everything is set out in order and you can look it up. Um, immigration is just not like that. Um, everything is so, uh, is so scattered and, um, and you know, of course there are statutes and regulations, but so much of this stuff exists in the form of, of you know, letters from an agency official to a practitioner who asked a question. Um, I remember one time when I was in government at a, at, at a briefing of one of the deputy commissioners that we used to work with and people were from all over the various regions in there <coughs> explaining this particular issue and the, the approach that the agency took and how there was a difference among the regions and how they approached it. And, and this, the deputy commissioner stopped and said, um, wait a minute, I mean, do we pass this stuff down by folk dances and songs? Um, you know, where's the order? Where's the guidance? Um, but so much of it is that way. And so that's one of the things that we've tried to accomplish with this book um, is to is to pull together all of these disparate sources of guidance so that the business immigration practitioner can, uh, can have them all at their fingertips. Yeah, and I would just add that uh, that's one of the reasons it's been such a pleasure doing this book with uh, Bo Cooper, uh, with someone who's had a career in government and in private practice. Um, he, he's seen it from the inside, seen the, the, the difficulties and the issues from the inside and from the outside. And that, that uh, to me, has been a tremendous uh, boon to getting this book done. How has the Ninth Circus decision in Kazarian v. USCIS impacted the practice of business immigration law? No, that's an interesting question, Tasha. Uh, I'm glad you asked because Kazarian, uh, I think there are two ways it impacts uh, immigration practice. Um, firstly, Kazarian institutes uh, effectively a two-tier review with respect to extraordinary ability or O-1 cases, and those are cases that practitioners are very interested in, business immigration practitioners. Um, so now it's not good enough just to fit the categories. So for example, um, if the individual meets three out of the 10, the, the requisite three out of the 10 categories, uh, that would have been fine before, but now it's not good enough. Uh, instead, there's a further inquiry, in, notwithstanding the fact that the person meets those three out of 10, is the person still of exceptional or, or, excuse me, extraordinary ability overall. So it's sort of another, another hurdle. Um, now, that's confined at the moment to extraordinary ability in 01 cases, but, but it's a troubling precedent, I think, for the rest of business immigration law. If the government were to broaden that out and use that approach in other areas, we'd be saying, well, does, uh, even though the person meets each one of the specific requirements for an L or an H visa, are they still overall the right person for that visa? And, and uh, that's a, that, that's a, a problem. Um, it, it, uh, it's particularly an issue because uh, the, the, the statute doesn't require it. 
So uh, we, we, think, uh, we think that's a problem for business immigration law. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an, an example of, you know, the dangers of agency gloss. Um, the agency, you know, in fairness to it, is in a situation where its adjudicators have to make decisions about very complex business situations, often, um, often subjects in which, you know, they don't have and, and, and shouldn't be expected to have full expertise. Um, and so they're given these guidelines to, um, to apply. They often can be very complex. Um, and you know, you see them responding sometimes by adding their own gloss to the particular criteria. And that's what, um, that's what I think um, was tamped down a bit in Kazarian, but, but still remains in the respect that Daryl was explaining, that the agency has, you know, still has this gloss that not only must you fulfill enough of the listed criteria, then on top of that, you basically have to show how extraordinary you are, um, instead of just being able to show that by um, fulfilling the requisite number of criteria. So I, I think it's about the dangers of agency clause. Yeah, now, to, to his great credit, uh, Director Miocas, the uh, director of the uh, CIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, did say yesterday in his address to AILA at the annual conference that uh, he was going to review the, uh, the Kazarian uh, memo and, uh, and he said, and I think I, I'm quoting him correctly when he said, uh, if we're wrong, we'll fix it. So um, at least he's got a very open mind to it. One of the things I think that's actually positive um, as a result of Kazarian is with respect to RFEs. Everyone's um, unsettled about the, about the RFE process right now. It's one of the most difficult aspects of practice in business immigration law. But there has been in this one area, you know, what people call the Kazarian RFE, where, where, where the agency will send you back an RFE going through criterion by criterion that you tried to address, saying, yes, you met this one, no, you didn't meet that one, here's why we think you did not. And it really is a roadmap to the petitioner um, for what issues remain in the eyes of the adjudicator. And that is what enables a practitioner to be able to go back and provide the evidence on behalf of their client. And so that's one of the things that we've seen that's been a positive result of the decision that we'd love to see spread elsewhere in other kinds of RFEs. What, if any, recent trends are you seeing in the adjudication of business immigration cases? Well, uh, business immigration cases have got a lot more complex, and uh, the adjudication of those cases has got a lot less predictable uh, in many respects. And I think that uh, that's something that, uh, again, that CIS is aware of. Um, it's something that, uh, that uh, we've, uh, as, as an organization, AILA has worked uh, tremendously with uh, CIS uh, and, the, and the other agencies to address. But uh, um, it's an acknowledged problem, and, and, uh, and I think CIS has recognized this, that there are more requests for evidence, um, that, that, uh, that there is a need for, um, for more uh, transparency, there is a need for more accountability, there is a need for adjudicators to, to, to understand more about the various industries, again, things that CIS is addressing. But, um, but uh, when, when uh, I started practicing business immigration law, in uh, 1979, uh, over 30, 32, 33 years ago, um, the, uh, the, uh, you, you filed a petition. Sometimes you took it down to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, presented the petition, got the approval, and went back to your office. Uh, very, very different uh, today, and particularly in the, last, uh, in the last year or two, much, much, much more complicated. Um, and of course, business immigration adjudication has been infected by the overall climate on immigration. Uh, the the post-9-11 era has been a difficult one for any adjudications, uh, and business adjudications have not been exempted from that. Post-9-11 era and, um, and you know, the economic crisis that the, that the country's been facing. And so you, know, you see decisions sometimes that, um, that make you worry that th it's not a case of the adjudicator saying, I've applied the standard to the facts and come up with this decision. You see situations where you worry a bit that the adjudicator may be saying, you know, I'm trying to make sure that U.S. jobs aren't going elsewhere. Um, and so you see these, uh, these decisions that, that may seem a bit like they're um, agenda driven is probably not the right word, but, but um, driven toward, toward a goal that's more than just a simple application of the law to the facts. Um, for example, um, you know, we see these trends where it's very, very, very difficult to get a petition approved in a circumstance where 
um, where the employer is sending the employee to a client work site. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's very clear that there's something about that arrangement, that business model that's bothersome to the agency, but, um, but it's tough to tackle that in the context of making a clear petition and then coming back with evidence when requested because the way that the agency adjudicators approach it um, is not so head on. And so, you know, you have these sort of amorphous kinds of, um, or, or, or I'm sorry, trying to get around the corner RFEs where you're dealing with some issue that's obviously bothersome to them, but, but you're sort of having to pick away at the edges of it. And it's become a real difficulty in the practice of business immigration law. Now, by the way, we, we uh, uh, as I think you know, Tasha, we produced this book um, as guidance, not just to private practitioners, but to agency personnel as well. The book doesn't express any uh, partisan opinion in any specific regard. It doesn't. Uh, it's it's not a pro-immigration or an anti-immigration book. It's it's it, it simply explains the law and strategy and uh, how a, a practitioner should best approach cases. Um, it, it informs with respect to the government, and that that was the concept of Bo and I partnering in order to get this book done. What are some of the current hot button topics related to the L1 non-immigrant visa category? The L1 category um, is critical for international business. It really is. And um, it is um, a difficult issue today that uh, notwithstanding the fact that L1s are used in order to bring foreign investment to the United States and to allow US companies to compete abroad, um, L1 adjudications have been subject to the kind of vicissitudes that we just discussed with respect to business immigration generally. Um, L1A uh, managerial and executive transfers have become uh, more difficult, particularly for smaller companies. Um, the, statistically, it's well known that uh, uh, the, the economy is powered by small business to a large extent and that uh, most uh, startup companies uh, are, are, are obviously small companies, and they're critical, particularly in today's economy. Um, there, there is uh, an unfortunate bias against smaller, smaller companies, uh, much, much harder for them to qualify in, in lots of ways. At the same time, both small and large companies have faced a lot of difficulties on certain categories, like the L1B category for specialized, uh, specialized knowledge. Um, we've seen a lot of concepts surface that were prevalent in the late 80s before IMACT 90, the Immigration Act of 1990, when the L1 law was liberalized. Those same concepts have surfaced now, like a requirement, for example, or a suggestion that the knowledge uh, to be specialized should be proprietary or that uh, it should be narrowly held within a company. Um, and and uh, uh, th there's been a lot of guidance over the years by the uh, Immigration Naturalization Service and, and, and uh, the Department of State, most recently a DOS memo this year in January. Uh, but notwithstanding that guidance, uh, the application of that guidance is a different question. It's interesting that the, uh, the Immigration Service, uh, the, the Citizenship and Immigration Service had, again to its credit, to the particular credit of Director Mayorkas, the service uh, had a stakeholder engagement meeting uh, just a few weeks ago to talk about the L1 category. And um, not one of the uh, speakers at that uh, engagement, and there were probably over 20, but not one of them uh, disagreed with the, not one of them suggested that there needs to be a new law or new rules uh, or, or, or even new guidance. Everyone said that the rules are there, the, the rules are clear, the guidance is clear, we just need to implement it. Somehow we've come off the tracks and we're, we're, we've come off the tracks in a way that's harmful to the U.S. economy. And I would say that, um, that with respect to the L, um, a couple of the issues that are on the horizon legislatively are, um, first of all, I think there's, there, is a, um, there is sort of a simmering mistrust of the blanket L program in Congress, and you see these um, you see these instances from time to time where Congress questions whether that should continue, um, and you know request reports, which is always an ominous sign about what their intentions are toward a program when Congress is asking for a report from the agencies, um, and um, it's one of those things that 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 I think is a misplaced fear. You know the perception and and, and uh, the perception among those who oppose the program are that it's just a it's just a, an L handout. Um, 
when in fact, of course, all the program is built around is the idea that if there are certain common decisions that can be made about the petitioning entity, you ought to make them once commonly and then apply that decision to, to every particular person who comes in and, and require that they show their qualifications. But that's not how it's perceived. It's perceived as, as, uh, as you know, a giveaway of L's. And so I think that, that, uh, that it's going to be important to watch out for the security of the blanket L program. Um, and then also, um, you know, you're seeing more and more frequently in Congress proposals that L's should be subject to a prevailing wage requirement. And, you know, it makes perfect sense that Congress didn't impose that uh, requirement when it, when it created and then modified the L category. I mean, these are people who um, are coming from abroad because of their experience abroad and often will return there. And, and it makes perfect sense in many instances for them to remain on, on foreign payrolls and so forth. Um, but, uh, but the notion that, um, that uh, they should be paid a prevailing wage um, is one that, uh, that I think you're seeing more and more gain momentum. There are other books on the market covering business immigration law. How does this book stand out among its competition? Well, I think in, in many <coughs> respects, um, this book is different because it, uh, th there are not a lot of books that cover business immigration. There are books, uh, obviously, that cover immigration that include business. And among those that cover business immigration, um, this book seeks to develop the strategy and, and uh, side by side with, uh, with delivering the law and, and, the, and the practice uh, at the same time. Um, so I think that would be the, um, the, the focus, don't you think? Yeah, we've tried to make it a mix between you know, straight how-tos and checklists very practical and pragmatic to um, more in-depth strategic considerations to really pulling together all the various sources of law so that the practitioner can have the full range of, um, of, of information about how the agency has, uh, has approached a particular issue right there at their fingertips. Is this book something the family immigration or removal practitioner should have? I would say to the extent, I mean, there's almost no area of immigration law that doesn't overlap with another. Um, and you've got to have a way of understanding those other aspects of immigration law that get grabbed into your particular issue. And so, um, and so I certainly think that this book um, could serve, we hoped to make it one that could serve as a resource for people who practice in other areas of law but need to understand um, uh, some business immigration law issue in order to serve, their, uh, in order to serve the issue that's before them. For example, if, a, uh, if an employment-related immigration matter involves an individual and then that individual is subject to a removal action because of a crime or because of uh, an overstay or something like that, which happens in the business area, the uh, removal practitioner would want to reach into business immigration law to understand what status the person was on and what the consequences of that status are. So yes, I would say definitely it's, it's relevant. The other aspect is that um, we've really paid a lot of attention to making this book the kind of book that would be helpful to, to be sitting on the desk of, of the general counsel or in-house counsel of a company. Um, and they are people who are dealing with lots of different areas. They may deal with benefits issues, employment issues, international law issues, tax issues, and so on. But when they need information, they need it quickly, they need it specifically, and they, they want to understand. Uh, get a roadmap to how to fix a problem, even if they aren't the people that are going to be fixing it. Um, and, and this book is designed for that too. What are some of the biggest issues facing practitioners today in the labor certification arena? You know, I think there are two problems in the labor certification. There, there are a number of problems, but I think there are two that, that uh, jump out at me. And the one is a very practical problem, and that is that it, it uh, the, the, the timing of being able to get a labor certification has gone from two or three months to, to from two or three years to two or three months and now back in certain cases to you know a year or more and uh, it's very very difficult and makes business very unpredictable when, uh, when, when, when that is the case. Um, having a user fee or some kind of premium processing fee with respect to a labor certification would and, and, and at least the appeal of a labor certification, which can take a year to two years, would be very essential in order to make um, uh, the immigration system more practical for, for companies 
and help government get its job done without an unfunded mandate. So that, that's a, that's a, I just express that as a personal opinion, not necessarily Ayla's opinion. But, but I think that's important. But, but the other issue which ties into that is um, shifting adjudication standards. So for example, the uh, Department of Labor will, will uh, uh, have a, a particular uh, policy with respect to an issue and adjudicate cases in a certain way, and then a case gets into audit and you spend 18 months in audit, and by the time you get to audit processing, the Department of Labor has changed its standard, and, and, and it's too late for the, the um, employer to do anything about that by that time. So, so then the employer is adjudicated under a new standard, and that, in our respectful uh, opinion, is changing the rules in the middle of the game and something that's, that's a problem uh, in any area, but, but specifically in the labor certification area. Yeah, I mean, the, the Department of Labor actually has, um, has been recently fairly successful at turning labor uh, certification applications around quickly and approving quickly cases that they consider to be clean. If that case gets bumped over into the audit trail or you know, after that into an appeal, then you're talking a very, very, very long period of time. And so for the practitioner, what that means is you need to be as sure as, uh, as you can that you're filing up front a case that's going to satisfy the Department of Labor. The challenge of that, of course, though, is the shifting adjudications that Daryl was talking about, um, where you, know, you can file something according to standards that, uh, that, that you think have, um, that, that have been fine and have, and have resulted in approvable cases for a good long time, then all of a sudden the Department of Labor might come up with a different view of, uh, of what's needed. Um, we've seen that with respect to um, to employee referral programs, for example, one of the things that you can do to show um, that you're recruiting for American workers. We've seen it with respect to, um, to what's permissible language to indicate whether travel may be required or may not in a group of positions that, that's being advertised for. Um, and so when you, when you see um, the agency making decisions on the basis of, of substantive criteria that are different from before, it's a real challenge in trying to get a case filed properly in the first place and get it approved quickly. Unlike some others, your book offers the reader citations. Is this important and why? We've tried to make it chock full of citations um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it is critical to be able to go show the agency when you're making a filing, um, it, you need to be able to draw the line for them to agency guidance that supports their favorable adjudication of what you've given them. And, you can, and if you can point them straight to the source, you're much better off. Um, and, and the second is that, um, that you know, these are, complex, these are complex issues many times, and they're gray areas. And so we wanted to try to point the practitioner um, or the in-house, uh, or the in-house immigration, or the government, or the government, um, to all the various utterances on a particular point, um, so that so that um, that they can have everything before them that's been said on the topic. Makes for a lengthy and difficult production. <laughs> having all those citations.